Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to do a move video today. <coughs> I was going to make it last night, and uh, <coughs> I got up early today. <coughs> I've been up for a few hours. It's uh, about 4.35 or 4.40 in the morning. And I want to cover, I guess, a little bit of more of the history that I've kind of been doing. I might recap some of the I will recap right now some of the Revolutionary War from 1775 to 1783. And this is some of the history I've been in. A uh, few notes. I uh, was going to visit my friend Don who had surgery for cancer yesterday. Now, Don's my friend who I go visit Don at the pier. He lives by a pier. You don't see Don on video because he's never been comfortable being on video, and then plus I'm not doing those anymore like I was with some of the friends and all. But, you know, this last few months, Don was very sick, and he was telling me, I've shared this already, and, you know, Don, was, he would tell me, he'd say, John, I'm just ready to die. He says, I have no joy, I'm in pain, I'm ready to die. He was saying that for months. You know, I was a firefighter for 25 years, and I did the EMT, and one thing that we always learned, they taught you in EMT and paramedics, it, whenever you have a patient, if you're at a, a wreck or whatever, and if they tell you they're going to die, you take that serious because people could sense that. That's why when I see some of these videos of the kids that are, the, the some of the famous cases of the kids that were, injured and they were put in the top vehicle and they were asking for help. I don't take those lightly. Some of the media, some conservative media played it as those kids were faking it or whatever. And then later that kid, that one kid died and he had head injury. And I, me watching these things, I could see, oh, that's what happened in this. So just in general, when people say that, so I'm going to try to see Don today because a friend texted me last night. I haven't seen him. I've seen him I went one day, and he was not in the room, but I figured I'd wait until after surgery, but a friend texted me and said, oh, he was very bad. He was last night saying, which would be early this morning, he said, uh, he's, he, I wanted to die, and I'm in pain, and so I hope, you know, but they told on the lady who did the surgery, I think it was a lady doctor, she said she never saw it that bad, okay? She said all the years doing it. They let it go so far without checking Don because they didn't want to give him the x-ray and the CAT scan because they knew he was going to have some. So they waited months and months and months and months. And when they finally gave him a CAT scan, another doctor said, you got to have an x-ray. we got to check you. They said, oh, it's, you know, you got a huge cancerous tumor growing. It's, so I don't know. I'm, you know, we pray. Now, a little of the history. Um that I was covering, and there's dates, I, I added some dates, and, you know, I'm a little disoriented right now, okay, I thought I'll make the video last night, because it helps me when I do the videos at night, because it clears my mind a little, but I waited, I figured oh, I'll be a little better tomorrow, which is now, and I should have made it last night, but right now, let's cover this, um, or a fight, for independence, I covered this already, is we, we today, as the United States of America, were originally the 13 British colonies, okay? And the British had law, okay? Government, police, if you will, or enforcement of society. They had it here, okay? In, in the British colonies. It wasn't that we were all living here in the in America and the British were just in Britain. No, no, we had law to a degree. We had people enforcing it. Now, there were disagreements, okay? And the disagreements began with various uh, taxing that the British were doing upon us, which were colonies. We were British colonies at the time, okay? And we didn't have a voice in Parliament, and I covered that, the Stamp Act, the Tea Act. There were a few little things like that, that there began to be a revolt. And uh, I think it was, now I'm going to quote some of the dates. I should have them close. 
but they're in the post. Now, I think it was in 1770, okay, this is really before the revolution breaks out. You could say the revolution was from 75 uh, to 83. It ends in the Treaty of Paris, officially. The fighting really ended in a, a, a defeat in uh, Yorktown, Virginia, in 1781. That was kind of the, uh, the last we defeated the British. There were back and forth battles. Okay, let, let me do a little. George Washington is the leader of the American troops, and the British troops who were fighting, who we called Redcoats, and, the, and of course, Britain had, they were the most, at that time, they were the strongest empire in the world. Okay, I was covering this with the Industrial Revolution and things like this. <coughs> so, you know, they sent a fleet of ships into the New York Harbor, and it was like when you originally think you're going up against, you know, the greatest world power, it was quite a thing. Okay, now I'm going to talk about some of this, how we glorify war like it's a sport. But... When we rebelled and said we're going to break away from the crown, Washington leads the troops, okay? And our troops, at the height of the war, there were about, oh, I think about 96,000 in the Continental Army. At one point, that would be like the highest that we had. And the British had about 133,000 in the British Royal Navy Army. Military. I got a. I'm looking here. I got a. You said, John, you planned this. No, I didn't. But this is like a little. Uh, I can't think of the name of this. Come on. You see? It's a telescope. I just like it. It was like an antique telescope I bought. But it was. This is one from the. You know, replica. So they had about 133,000 troops at the height of the war. At the end of the war, I'm jumping all around, there was about 50,000 men that died. Okay? And almost even, about 25,000 on each side. But when Washington, uh, the battle rages, all in, where you've seen me in the videos a few months ago, it's all in New York, Boston, okay, across New Jersey into Pennsylvania. I could me I get that whole trip memorized. I was making videos on that road. But that's where the fight really takes place. And, of course, eventually, you know, the colonies, 13 colonies, all the way down to Virginia. But this is the, the battle in Washington. We have some famous stories in history. But Washington goes, and we're fighting the British, okay? Uh, they have a few victories. And Washington is driven back. He's driven back out of New York City, coming back all the way across the Delaware River, which I crossed, not this recent trip, but a few trips ago, and then into Pennsylvania. At a one point in the war, uh, the Continental Congress was held in Philadelphia, and even Philadelphia is evacuated. The U.S. is, the, the colonies are losing at one point. And Washington and his troops, there was bad conditions, harsh winters, but eventually they, they make a surprise attack and they're going to now come back and fight the British, and push them all the way back. And they uh, cross the Delaware River, very, very tough time and very harsh conditions. They were on uh, uh, fishermen, merchant fishermen boats, took them across, okay? We've got pictures of this when you study history. And we had a great victory at Trenton, New Jersey, which uh, Trenton is the capital, by the way. And we defeated the British and also in Princeton, okay, these uh, New Jersey. And so these were kind of important battles. We lost a battle at, uh, we lost some, gained some, but Brandy, Brandy Wine Creek, I think was named, but it was one lost. But then in 1781 at Yorktown, Virginia, was the ultimate battle that the that George Washington and our troops defeated the British again, back and forth it went, and that was kind of the end of it. And then we signed the treaty. They recognized our independence. In 1778, France officially entered the war on our side, okay? And then the war, it, it took on the dimensions more of 
not just a civil war, but if you will, like a world war, because sides were uh, taking. And when the French, they were backing us already, but in 1778, they officially backed us. Uh, some of the famous stories of the Boston Tea Party was one, the, uh, the colonists dressed up like American Indians and the ships were bringing tea from the East India Company, British teas coming in. And so we dressed up like Indians, Bostonians, and went on the ships and threw the tea into the water saying, no, you know, we're, we're protesting Britain. And there were two occasions, 1773, I believe, is the famous one that we remember. We call it the Boston Tea Party. It also happened, I think, in January of 74, two times. These are the notable things. Paul Revere uh, is known for his ride uh, to Lexington uh, to warn that the British are coming. It's known in history as he was yelling it, the British are coming, but most historians will say actually it didn't happen that way because there were only certain people that he was going to notify because the British were already here, but they were coming, you know, with their navy and with their troops. But they're already here, so more than likely Paul Revere wasn't yelling it in the streets because the British were here. Now, what is, why is it important to understand that aspect now, that there was already a form of law and order in, in our Revolutionary War? Now, down the road, I'm going to do the Civil War. But in both of these wars, uh, Christians had various sides, and they were based on Scripture. And some Christians, there are verses in the Bible, and as I teach down the road, you know, I've taught some of this already, but some verses say, obey the king, pay taxes, submit, because Paul in the book of Romans, the only authorities there are are ordained of God, and if they weren't kings and governors, and if they weren't over you, uh, if they're over you, it's because God ordained it, therefore don't rebel against them, these are verses. And there were sincere Christians and preachers who said, look, it's quite clear. We don't have, we're not justified in an armed fight, rebellion, revolution, just over taxes. And I could see how people could think that. And of course, others said no. And we're going to have the same thing in the Civil War later on. You're going to have Christians in the South, but... You're going to have Christians, there are verses that say, slaves, obey your masters. Paul again, in the New Testament. But others, of course, and I would agree with, the way I would always explain it is, look, the ultimate purpose of the gospel is for people to be free from bondage, okay? Deliverance from slavery. This language is used in scripture, so that would be the overriding theme that God wants freedom. But you had Christians on both sides of both the Civil and Revolutionary War basing their objections on Scripture. And so uh, I want to talk down the road. How, 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 how could that be, John? Um, as I was just reviewing some of this yesterday, and I wanted to maybe this morning review a little, thinking, okay, I'll wait. But it didn't work out that way. I did it real briefly. I had to, like you know, get start the video. Today I'm going to have a full day, and I was trying to cut down a little. But, um, <clears throat> could we have some of the great uh, battles, uh, Bunker Hill, and I just told you there was 50,000 people killed, which compared to some of the other wars maybe we'll cover down the road, that wasn't a whole lot. But it was 50,000. Are there ever ways historically, John, where countries and people had disagreements over things and they didn't, they never killed, they never went to war? You say, John, oh, you're just being a peace activist. No, I'm, there were cases where historically where people had disagreements over whatever it was countries, and they didn't go to war. Now, they're rare, but they made the settlement. 
And could there have been a way that our disagreement with the British crown could have been solved without actually any of that? There could have been. You know, scriptures says, seek peace, pursue peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. The Christian ideal is you don't go to war, and in the end you don't kill. But what you don't have in those other... You say, John, I'm not real familiar with some of those other ones where they were settled peacefully. There were, but yes, you're not familiar with them. Because you don't have the great battles. You don't have the great... It doesn't attract, you see. So we have a danger in our society and in humanity. We're going to have the Super Bowl. I don't follow it at all. I don't even know who's playing. Okay? But we have a sport mentality when it comes to war. We, we see, and, and as I was looking, you know, looking at some of the facts and stats the last couple of days, going to talk about it, that's how it's played out. And, and, and we see these great things and these great battles. And, and even when you're looking at the numbers of the dead, I mean, we're not realizing these are dead, you know, that these are killings taking place over disagreements, and we glorify those things. And uh, I'm, I'm just covering a little history for you, and I'm not, but uh, one of my favorite theologians, I won't mention his name, but a favorite teachers, scholar, true scholar, and I re-listened to some of his teachings over the years, because he's, he's a scholar, and I try to listen to theologians. I don't, there's some good preaching you can hear, you know, on radio or whatever, but I would try, I try to learn, okay? But I, every so often when I'm going through some of his old CDs, on CDs, uh, I forget if he's doing philosophy, he teaches philosophy too, but he talks about a certain point, he says, that the, and the peace activists, they're living in a dream world. They want to put daisies down the barrels of guns. And he said, I heard that a few times because I re-listened to him. But every time I used to hear it, I thought, he's saying it in a critical way, like, live in the real world. But look, that's real. I'm not being naive. I'm saying the Christian ideal would be daisies down the barrels of guns. Okay? It's peace. And it doesn't seem as you know, glorious as the great battles, you know, and, and the great things that we read about in the history books. That is the intention of God. You say, John, I own, a, I own a gun, okay? I bought a handgun many, many, many years ago because in Texas it's very easy to buy guns. I never knew that until I came to Texas. I said, man, I can go into Walmart and buy a gun? And that's, what, uh, oh, I ordered it at a gun shop. <laughs> because you don't need, you didn't need and that same gun. It's legally owned. I'm not a felon. <laughs> but I had it for years. It's still, <clears throat> you know, the original one I bought back in when? Ever, 1981 or something. But we, uh, we glorify and, and we don't see that the ultimate intention of God is that there'd be war no more. There's scripture on this. And when they came to take uh, Jesus for the crucifixion, Peter cuts off the servant's ear. And uh, I think his name is Malchus. But Peter says, we're going to fight. And Jesus says, no. And he heals him. Now, I, I want you to see Jesus was a revolutionary. And I was going to comment a little on Corinthians. But I have it in the post. I added some stuff in the post. But he was revolutionary who did not condone violence, okay? And if we want to get into what's called just war theory, which is the church under men like St. Augustine and others through the history of Christianity tried to develop what, what would be times where war is acceptable. And I do understand we read about battles in the Old Testament. So Christians tried to develop a doctrine, <laughs> When would war be acceptable? But we often, we have statements. See, uh, this one I'm dealing with is, what are our ideologies? 
Uh, okay, what are the things you would die for? And, w- and some of the great things that we will be studying in this time period are uh, give me liberty or give me death, okay? These famous statements. We hear people say, I might not believe in what you say, your beliefs, your belief system, but I would die for your right to say it. Some of you might say, yes, that's, yes, I would. Would you? Is that a Christian ideal? Is that a Christian ethic? It is not. You say, it's not? It's not. It's not. We base, okay, some of the founding documents that I'm talking about and the Enlightenment influence in the founding fathers. This all fits into this period of time. And we base some of our principles as in if the greatest right is for you to have the free expression to do whatever you want. That's not a biblical ideal. That's not a biblical ethic. Paul says, you were slaves to sin, you're now free, and you're a debtor to Christ. You're a debtor to lay down your life. Use not your freedom as uh, just to do whatever you want. Now that you're free from bondage, you owe a debt to lay down your life in service, to bear your cross. Now, when we use the term in our society, I would die to protect your right. Look, we often don't mean that. We, what that often means is I would go to war, and I'd also be willing to kill someone else to protect a certain right. You see? That's really what that means when you say, give me liberty or give me death. He wasn't just saying, if I don't get the liberty, then kill me. He was saying, if I don't get the liberty, I'll attempt to kill you, and I might die in the process. See, that's what that statement means. I'd be willing to die or kill for a certain ideal. And in Scripture, when it says, Christ died for sinners that Christ died for you, that's what that means. It didn't mean he'd be willing to kill for a certain ideal, okay? And so what we have to do is, you know, we're citizens of a higher kingdom, and it's okay to be patriotic, but you got to understand that our principles, how we believe, does not come from It comes from scripture, okay? And so I wanted to just challenge that. I wouldn't die. I might not believe in what you believe, but I'll die for your right to say it. Would you do that for Hitler? Spewing anti-Semitic statements, which eventually led, you know, what you think, what you say eventually, worldviews eventually play out in real time. So I, I don't think I would... I don't think we should embrace that. I might not believe what you believe, but I would die, which means die or kill for your right to say it. No, that's not necessarily. We criticize. The president spoke at a mosque yesterday, and I wasn't, I didn't plan on, I'm a big news reader, news watcher. And then, of course, I saw during the day, it came out on some of the, it came out on some of the news things. The president will be speaking at mosque. Tonight, it was going to be critical. I didn't plan on catching it. But then throughout the day, later on, I'm catching the news at night when I eat my meal, my one meal a day. And sure enough, one of the reclips of the news, I guess, was playing big parts of the speech. And I saw him there with his gray hair speaking to that mosque. No, and of course, he knew he was going to get criticism, but I listened. And he spoke very well. He spoke very well. And, and I don't, you don't always see him or any politicians really speaking what you think maybe they know what they're going to get criticism for. But it wasn't a political speech. And we're living in a political season right now. But he spoke well, okay? And I liked what he said. And I just... I didn't listen to, you know, the critics. I'm sure there were many. We have difficulty at times, and we're in 
put that block on the door. We have difficulty at times. Uh, I guess being, some of the scriptures I didn't cover, but in Corinthians, let's keep this feast. Paul, Corinthians 3 through 5 is what I was going to cover a little bit. Paul says, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He is the sacrifice. And let's keep this feast with unleavened bread, which meant no malice, but being sincere, speaking truth, not having hidden agendas, meaning this community that we're a part of uh, is patterned after the symbol of the Old Testament Passover lamb. They kept that feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, which was a sign leaven at that time. It became a sign of sin. It's not always a sign of sin, but... And, and when they kept the feast in the Old Testament, I'm reading some good verse in the Old Testament, but there had to be no leaven. So Paul says, Jesus is our Passover. So now let's have this fellowship. Let's not live in vain glory. He talks about the gift of the apostle. And he says, I think God has set forth us the apostles last. We are a spectacle. We are a disgrace. He says this. I think God except for the apostles last as it were appointed to death. For we have made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. A spectacle. <laughs> let's look at, you know, let's the court jester. Let's see. It's a pretty day out this morning. People talk about... I wish you could see the stars. So he's, Paul says, we are a spectacle. God has made us the apostles last. You are doing so good, you Corinthians. You are wonderful. You are, and look at us. We're in, we have no certain dwelling place. We're not comfortable anywhere we're at. We don't feel like we can ever have rest. We're defamed. We're the filth of the, earth, of the world. The offscoring of all things unto this day. That's Paul talking about his ministry. That's they were disgraced. They were looked at as a bunch of idiots and fools. And then in chapter 5, was, Paul says, And then there was someone in the congregation in the church, and he was sleeping with his father's wife, probably his stepmom, not his actual mother. But Paul says to the Corinthians, because that was the Corinthian problem. They were wicked. <laughs> they lived in a time in a city in that, it was like Amsterdam at the time, Corinth. And so, he says, and this brother's living in fornication. And he says, but you're not even broken about it. You're, you're puffed up. You're, and Paul says, this is the judgment I've made. Though absent in body, yet present in spirit. Though absent in body, yet present in spirit. He says, commit such a one of the sin for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. When you are gathered together with my spirit, very interesting, he says, I'm going to be there. He says, I'm right there making passing judgment along with you. Not a vengeful judgment, but that that brother who's sleeping with his father's wife, and he's doing it openly, publicly, he's part of the Christian congregation. He said, now, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of flesh. Now, in 2 Corinthians, Paul's going to, the result happened. Now, there's a little debate. I, I'm sure I wrote about it in the commentary that I posted, which I wrote a long time ago. I'm not reading my commentaries that I'm posting, so follow. <coughs> You'll see if I'm consistent or not, <coughs> because I wrote those commentaries a while ago. But you could take that in two ways. In the, in the New Testament, we read things in the letters of John, the epistles of John, about a sin unto death. We read things about unpardonable sin. And so, there seems to be sin in Scripture where a person also faces physical death, okay? And Paul was saying these verses, Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God, and if any man defile the temple, him will God destroy. And so Paul's telling these Corinthians, and this thing of committing unto sin for the destruction of flesh, he was saying, there comes a time where you love, you care, you share. But if anyone calls himself a brother, is part of the Christian community, bearing the name of Christ, but openly in adultery or openly in sin and not repentant, there has to be judgment, okay? This is where we get excommunication from, these scriptures, okay? And it, but later in 2 Corinthians, 
if Paul says, now, if he repented, which it seems to be he does, he says, now confirm your love on him. So if he messed up, it was good for you to shun him, to excommunicate him. But don't do it forever, <laughs> said, because now, that you know, it might go too far if he repents. And so you're seeing both the goodness and the severity of God in pulses and Romans. I did this in the past recently. Uh, Behold the goodness and the severity of God. On you which fell goodness, but on them severity. See how good God was to you? He said, oh, look at all these cases, these people I pray for. I just saw another one. He said, oh, thank God we're not. He says, but the goodness of God fell on us. So through the mercy that God's shown to us, others might obtain mercy. So God says, you know why you're not dead in jail <laughs> or all these other things that happen to people? And sometimes as you say, John, I'm not in there because I didn't do certain things. Yes, but there's some people that uh, Michael Morton did almost 30 years for the murder of his wife, which he also didn't do. So you didn't have to go through some of those things. And you know, they hated Michael Morton. They accused him. I think the case was in Texas. Michael Morton was working, I think, at a Walmart. And he came home one day, and his wife was dead. And they had a new little baby boy, young kid. And, of course, they didn't know who did it. It's a case, a whole documentary. And there was this up-and-coming startup prosecutor. Forget his name. I saw it on the documentary a few times over the years. And they said he was like a rock star. He was like a rock star. Because now they interviewed in the documentary all the jurors. And that's what they said. They said, man, he just controlled that room. His persona, his image. And they accused Michael Morton. They started interviewing him about the death of his wife. And he said, I came home and she was dead. Bludgeoned, murdered. And over time, interviews, they decided to say, it was your birthday that day, which I think it was, Michael Morton's birthday. And they said, and you wanted to have sex with her. They've developed the theory. But she didn't want to have sex with you, Mr. Morton. And you complained to people that she didn't give it enough to you. Isn't that right, Mr. Morton, the prosecutor? <laughs> it's not a biblical role to make accusation. It's not a biblical role say that for you prosecutors to understand that it is not a biblical role to make that accusation. You put yourself in a place of judgment because many times, even in cases where there is innocence, your official role and capacity is to make accusation. And he killed and he murdered. And sometimes, even if that person is declared innocent at the end, you release that accusation. It's bringing a judgment on you. I know my Christian friends who are prosecutors don't understand this. So in the Michael Morton case, they said, you killed her because she didn't want to have sex with you. There was no physical evidence or nothing. They believed that prosecutor and sentenced him to life or whatever. And he was shocked, claimed his innocence. But then when, during his time in prison, talked about the various prisons, had learned to make it, made some friends. They interviewed in the documentary I saw. The killers became his friends in prison. He said because a lot of the other prisoners had histories of things. He said, but oftentimes the guys that were sent up for murder, real murders that they were guilty of, he said a lot of them didn't have maybe a big criminal past. There was an act of passion or act of rage. They murdered. So Michael Morton said some of those guys became his friends. And he learned how to live. Michael Morton, he said, this wasn't even a Christian documentary. He said, one night after many years trying to appeal his case, they had evidence that there was a handkerchief found in the backyard, clothes, and the, and the defense lawyers for years and years when Michael Morton was in prison, his son used to come visit Michael Morton. He loved his son. That's all he had left. His wife was killed. 
And one day his son said, Dad, I'm not coming no more. You're not even my father. And his son, in the documentary I saw, it, began reading the stories. He was raised like by a relative. Now that whole family hated him. Because for years, the accusations that were false against Michael Morton were like poison. Scripture says it's like poison in people. It's like arrows. Thomas Jefferson said when the... <coughs> at one point, the British took Monticello, the home of Jefferson in Virginia, and Jefferson fled. And they were going to bring charges against Jefferson for cowardice. And Jefferson said those accusations stuck with him. And in the case of Michael Morton, his son finally, as his son used to visit him in jail, and the aunt or the sister-in-law used to bring him, and but they hated him because the words, the false testimony of the prosecutor were like poison because even though he did not kill his wife, that's what was declared over him. And they hated him. They hated Michael Morton. And then he said one day his son came, and his son was going to finally be of 17 or 18, and he told his dad, I'm, I'm not going to see you no more, Dad. And his son said he read all those newspaper articles how his father killed his mother because she refused to have sex with him, which was all false. These were all accusations that were false, that were made by a prosecutor who the, the jurors in the case said, he was like a rock star. Forget that prosecutor's name. I saw a video of it, like a rock star. He was building his career. And they fought to test. Maybe there's DNA. Maybe there's something on that uh, material they found in the back. And then they finally got the point they could finally test it. Let's test it. They still had the evidence. And the prosecutor sued. Then it took seven more years. Mike Morton did almost 30 years in prison. But finally they got, they sued. They did not want to test it. Finally they tested it. And on that rag or handkerchief was the blood of Michael Morton's wife and also the DNA of another man who was known, not someone, I don't, not a serial killer, but committed other crimes like that. His DNA was on that rag found in the backyard. And they tracked it down. He was living in that neighborhood at the time of the killing many years. They still did not want to release Michael Morton. At that point, it was obvious. The DNA of another man who's killed and had a, a, a same thing that he did those things was in that neighborhood. They still were not going to release him. And finally, I guess some other prosecutor said, look, this guy's innocent. They didn't care at that point. They wanted to just keep him in, at least that one prosecutor. And his son, after his son said they finally came to his door, the defense lawyers, after all those years, because his son already cut his father off. And they said, your dad's going to be released. He was innocent all these years, and you've you built this hatred for your father and your family. You hate him. You hate He did all those years, wasn't even, and you hate him. And his son was not, still hated his dad. He said, because it was built into him to hate him. And it was all through false accusation in that case. And his son said, I was not prepared. His son grew up and got married. Eventually, he did reconcile with his father. Very, very sad case. Now, that has not happened to most of you. Most of it's not happened to us. So behold the goodness and the severity of God. Okay? Maybe your life has gone a different way. But you're required also to identify and, and to stand up for people without voice. And that's just one little example I give you. And in the end, and we should never resort to, I know that in our covering some of this, 40 minutes, uh, we, we should never resort to think that the answer is violence or killing or murdering. In Scripture, the ideal is you lay down your life for another. You should be willing to, and a greater love has no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. That is a Christian ideal, to die for another. To die for another, but not to kill. That's not a Christian ideal, ethic. Okay? So I think we should 
reevaluate sometimes. I didn't cover as much uh, some of those historical parts. I'm going to have it in the post. And I have some of those verses on Corinthians in there. Uh, and even in that one case I just hit on where Paul said, I wasn't there. He says, but in spirit I'm with you. And when you gather together, uh, there's going to be a judgment on that brother that's sinning. Or there's going to be a judgment even in society upon sin. But the purpose is to bring repentance. Okay? That's the purpose. Judgment is never vengeance in the sense of we just want to get even. Retribution. It's, it's to bring forth, it says in Hebrews, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, but they didn't always do it with the pure intent. But how much more if we submit to the discipline of the Father of Spirits, God himself, we will live, who gives perfect discipline to produce righteousness and holiness. And Michael Morton, I'll end, I wasn't going to even discuss him. One night when he was in prison, trying to fight to get that evidence tested, all those things. And as far as I know, it was not a Christian documentary that I watched, but he said he was laying at night, he would lay in his bed in his prison cell, and he would just put on his little stereo, his little radio he had. But he wouldn't look for music or anything, he'd just find a station where there was static, white noise. And if he could leave that on, it said it blocked out all the noise that you'd hear in the prison. And he said he came across a station, not so much a Christian station, a station that was playing classical music. And as he sat there and he listened to it, he said he had an experience with God. God came to his cell. And it wasn't like he was seeking God or anything. And he said, God came and visited him. And then Michael Morton began thinking while he was in prison. He said, why would God visit me? He said, who am I? He says, I'm nothing. He saw himself unworthy. After being framed, after being in prison all those years, after uh, the rock store prosecutor put you in prison. But he didn't, he began seeing himself as unworthy of God visiting him that night when he had the music on. And then eventually the case did break. And I, I thought that interesting. And when you see him on that documentary, there's like, you can see the presence of God on Michael Morton. And he said, why would God visit me? He said, I was no prophet. I was no special thing. He was, he saw it as God. He began seeing what... A, how good God was that he visited him in that cell. And Joseph said, well, I've covered Joseph on one of those New Jersey videos. He said, well, you meant for evil, God meant for good, that he could save much life. And so today, I want us to reevaluate. I want us to reevaluate the history of uh, killing and war and fighting and all these things. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of it is hatred. James and a letter of James written by the brother of Jesus the epistle of James the only wisdom literature that fits in that category in the New Testament whence come wars and fightings of mine with you where do they come from come they not hence even of your own lust which war in your members that's the root of it it's the root of it okay so let me bless you guys and we'll go see my friend in a little while the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless everybody.